Hi, I'm Mark Mancy, and I will present my work on testing and evaluating system software on machines with terabytes of memory. This is joint work with my advisor, Mike Swift. Systems with terabytes of memory are just on the horizon, but does system software scale to such large systems? Perhaps not. In our experiments, we started by doing what most people would probably do. We installed Ubuntu and tried to boot it. Unfortunately, Ubuntu apparently doesn't support one terabyte of memory. This is undocumented and the failure mode is hanging on boot without any error message. Eventually, we switched to CentOS, which does have documented guarantees on hardware support. When we finally booted a machine, we tried to run a four terabyte memcached workload, but halfway through, the workload encounters an out of memory error despite having two terabytes of available memory. We contacted the lead developer, but they were unable to pinpoint what the error might be because they had never tried memcached with such a ridiculous amount of memory. The issues aren't limited to bugs and functionality either. For example, the Linux kernel used to have a policy that allowed dirty buffers to occupy up to a fixed percentage of memory, for example 1%. On a 10 gigabyte system, this is 100 megabytes, which can be flushed quickly. However, on a 1 terabyte system, this can be 10 gigabytes, which can take a long time to flush and result in poor application performance. This and other problems have been observed and discussed on kernel mailing lists and news sites, as well as application documentation, and they'll become even more important due to the new memory technologies that are on the horizon that promise up to 6 terabytes on a two-socket two system. Generally, we call this the capacity scaling problem. As the amount of memory grows to huge sizes, system software should perform as well as it does on today's machines, and it certainly shouldn't crash. However, this is not the case. In particular, linear overheads for many algorithms and data structures are problematic for huge systems. However, while testing and research are needed to prepare system software for the future, the high cost of huge systems today prevents it. Let's take a look at what are the options of a developer or researcher today. First, you can rent a four or five terabyte cloud instance on any major cloud provider for about $25 per hour. In our experience though, experiments often have to run for many hours because we want the long-term behavior to manifest. So this ex expense can add up. If you want even larger machines, you can sign a contract at a cost of hundreds of thousands of dollars per year. Alternately, you could buy a machine, but this is also expensive because it requires buying the 128 gigabyte memory DIMMs, custom motherboards, and high-end processors needed to support such large amounts of memory. So there's a clear need for tools that can help us to study these problems. And for that reason, we built ZeroSim. ZeroSim simulates the behavior of unmodified system software on terabyte scale systems using readily available hardware, such as standard developer workstations or servers. It uses data obliviousness and memory compression to make large, long-running simulations feasible and fast, but at the same time, it is accurate enough to preserve important trends and behavior. Later, I'll take a look at some of our experiences using ZeroSim for debugging memcached and doing early exploration of fragmentation at huge scales. So how does it work? First, we have unmodified system software running in a simulation. This is the target software that we want to evaluate. In this example, it's a Linux kernel. To exercise the system software, we also need to run a workload, exemplified here as a key value store. Note that the goal of ZeroSim is to evaluate system software, not necessarily applications. And all of this is running in the ZeroSim simulator. The first challenge we run into is that commodity hardware doesn't support the amounts of memory we would like to simulate. For example, the processor in my workstation only has 38 physical address bits, which is only enough for 512 gigabytes of memory. We circumvent these limitations by using virtualization. The entire simulation is run in a virtual machine, and ZeroSim is implemented partially as modifications to the KVM hypervisor.
This allows the hypervisor to emulate parts of the simulated system that the hardware doesn't actually support. For example, the hypervisor can translate wide addresses to ones the processor can handle. A second challenge is how to preserve the timing and behavior of the simulated software. We can do this by virtualizing timestamp counters so that they only report the passage of time in the simulation, rather than time spent by the hypervisor to do work such as translating addresses. And finally, we need to achieve fast, large-scale simulations. This is hard because the simulation contains terabytes of simulation state, but the host only has modest amounts of memory. I'll focus more on this challenge, but you can read about all of these in our paper. So what do we do with all of that state? One option is to write it all to disk, but this is slow. Even on a fast NVMe device, a 4 kilobyte read can take tens of microseconds, which is still orders of magnitude slower than memory. A second option is to compress the data in memory on the host so that accessing it only incurs the cost of decompression. The challenge here is that the data may not be compressible enough. This is in fact what ZeroSim does, so how do we make it work? We make the observation that the actual contents of the workload often don't matter. For example, a key value store doesn't actually need to care what the values in the key value pairs are. It just stores them. Likewise, in a matrix multiplication, we can replace the contents of the matrix with whatever we want, such as zeros or a sparse matrix. We call such workloads data oblivious. That is, their control flow and memory reference patterns are the same regardless of their input. So how does ZeroSim use this? Consider the key value store I mentioned before. We can replace the contents of the values with all zeros. When the hypervisor attempts to swap out an all zero guest page, ZeroSim can intercept the page and compress it down to one bit in a bitmap. This achieves a 32,000 to 1 compression ratio, which is much better than the 3 to 1 ratio Linux's memory compression system achieves by default. Moreover, for pages that are not zero, such as the text section or stack, we can fall back to aggressive compression, often achieving 256 to 1 compression ratios, which is still much more aggressive than Linux's default behavior. So we've seen that ZeroSim uses virtualization to circumvent hardware limitations, such as address widths. It preserves timing by virtualizing hardware timestamp counters to hide the time spent in the hypervisor, and it uses data obliviousness and memory compression to achieve speed and scale. How well does this work? We ran a few workloads to see how effective data obliviousness and memory compression are. The second and third columns in this table show how much memory the test machine has versus how much memory we simulated, respectively. The test machines are commodity workstations and servers that we happen to have access to. Notice also the last row, NASCG, is interesting because it uses sparse matrices naturally, and we actually run it unmodified. This column shows the average compressibility of pages that the host attempted to swap out. Notice that a 200 to 1 compressibility ratio means that a workload takes less than 0.5% of its original size. Moreover, we can see that 95% of the pages that we attempted to compress were all zeros, uh, meaning that they can compress down to one bit. This highlights the effectiveness of data obliviousness. We can also look at the speed of ZeroSim. In this plot, we show the simulation time of a one terabyte memcached workload running on my workstation as we increase the number of simulation cores. The white portion of each bar represents time spent in the actual simulation, whereas the black portion represents simulation overhead. First, notice that the, the time scale for a simulation here is in hours for a one terabyte workload on my five-year-old machine, and that the worst case slowdown is 31x compared to native execution for this workload. This is comparable to running on a machine from the early 2000s. This is far better than architecture simulators, which often incur 10,000x slowdown or worse. In fact, 
It's good enough to interact with the workload, as we'll see a little later. Second, we see that the workload's completion time, the white portions of the bars, improve with the number of cores, as we would expect. We would now look, like to look at some of our experiences using ZeroSim. Recall at the beginning of the video, I mentioned that we were having trouble running a 4 terabyte memcached workload. We were getting a mysterious out of memory error halfway through the, the workload. We ended up debugging this by just attaching GDB to memcached directly inside the simulation. This highlights how fast ZeroSim is. In this case, the problem was an unexpected interaction between multiple pieces of system software, the kernel, glibc's malloc implementation, and memcached. Memcached kept calling malloc to allocate more memory, and malloc was calling mmap to get more memory regions from the kernel. But the kernel was limiting the number of memory regions per process, resulting in an allocation failure. While this is not a very complicated bug, it highlights the sort of problems that haven't been found yet because it's difficult to test software at large scales today. ZeroSim can help with that. We also used ZeroSim to do some early exploration of fragmentation on huge systems. We ran a mix workload consisting of, of a micro benchmark that pins and unpins memory, simulating a, the DMA buffers of a driver, a Redis key value store, and a matrix multiplication workload. And here we're interested in looking at the distribution of pages across the various kernel free lists, indicating how much contiguous free memory there is. In this plot, the x-axis is time and the y-axis is the amount of free memory, broken down by which free list the memory is in. Purple and dark blue represent memory in two and four megabyte contiguous chunks, which are large enough for a huge page. Light blue to red represents smaller contiguous regions down to a base page of four kilobytes. We can see that for the first two and a half hours, the free memory is fairly contiguous. But at two and a half hours, we see that 40 gigabytes of memory is too fragmented to allocate a huge page. This fragmentation not only persists, but worsens despite having 300 gigabytes of free memory, so that by the end of the workload, there are 100 gigabytes of memory that is too fragmented to even allocate a huge page. While we're not the first to look at fragmentation, this experiment highlights the importance of prototyping and finding new designs. As memories become larger, these problems are growing in importance. In this talk, I described the capacity scaling problem and showed through multiple examples that system software does not scale well to large memory sizes. ZeroSim is a promising tool that addresses these issues, it is open source and available on GitHub, and we look forward to seeing what the community does with it.